I just finished rereading a book called uh, Pacific Crucible. It's volume one in a thing called the Pacific War Trilogy. And that was written by a man named Ian Toll. In the trilogy, he divides the war into three parts, as you'd expect. The first one, Pacific Crucible, covers the period from 1941 to 1942. The second one, The Contouring Tide, takes the story down to 1944. And finally, a book called Twilight of the Gods takes you to the end of the war. Now, Ian Toll is a naval historian, and he wrote another naval history that was called Six Frigates. It concerns the creation of the United States Navy. I read it years ago, and I loved it. Back to the trilogy. It took him over 10 years to write this thing. And as you'd expect, it's an, over war, it's an overview of the war in the Pacific, principally concerned with the naval aspect. Before I get into discussing these books, let me mention my one major limitation. I never, ever served in the United States Navy. So anything that I say, uh, you Navy veterans who might be watching, take it with a grain of salt. Back to the books. The range of topics that he considers is extraordinary. He goes from the top political levels in these countries right down to the guys who are working in the engine rooms, and he touches on everything in between. The list of subjects he gets into will blow your mind. I'll take off a few of them. Strategy, tactics, logistics, uh, command structures, and even internal Navy power struggles. Now that would be a huge effort if he simply confined himself to the United States side of the equation, but he doesn't do that. He also looks at the same things from the Japanese side. I think in attempting this kind of history, he faced three main challenges. The first one was the enormous amount of material he had to deal with. You've got n newspapers at one end, and on the other end, you have ship logs and even transcripts of radio messages between pilots and carriers. In addition to looking at that stuff, he took a look at diaries, letters, government reports, and all kinds of other stuff to flesh in the picture. Now, much as this is, remember, multiply it by two, because he's covering the Japanese side as well. And I, frankly, I have no idea how you get your arms around all that kind of stuff. His second challenge in writing this kind of history, I think, was one of organization. And the book's a narrative and style, so battles, big ones, provide the major milestones. But he's also got to find in a way to weave in these other topics that I mentioned above, strategy, tactics, technology, and he does it pretty well. The upshot is that the books have a fairly good pace and continuity, but at the same time, you've got a good idea of what each side was trying to do with the stuff that they had at their disposal. I think he pulled it off very, very well indeed. Now, the third challenge, of course, was to write it all down in a very clear way. He does this but also for want of a better word, I think it's pretty compelling. Now, you know how this whole thing is gonna come out in the end, but the way he writes it, it keeps you turning pages to see how they got there. Now, obviously, with the scope of these books, things are gonna get treated a little bit briefly. And I don't think they even permit an amateur like me to reach any kind of hard and fast conclusions about particular in incidents and people. Uh, take, for example, the Battle of Midway. I don't think you can really draw any conclusions about the performance of the carrier Hornet in that battle without reading a whole lot more about it. And even if you have read other books about the Battle of Midway, I'm not sure you can reach any decent conclusions anyway. I had some takeaways. On the Japanese side, I was struck by their overriding emphasis on aggression. And that had a, uh, an impact on training and weapon systems. They relied on very intricate uh, and far-flung fleet operations, which affected things like the Battle of Midway. And finally, I'm struck by the kind of casual disregard for uh, safety 
Contrasted with the American side, which actually saved a lot of men and a lot of ships. For the American side, I'm really struck by our talent for organization and management, personnel selection. Sure, we had overwhelming industrial and economic superiority, but somebody, somebody had to pull it all together. Now also, I've got to say that the U.S. Navy strikes me as being very, very adaptable. You could say resilient. It seems to have had the ability to be continually learning from mistakes and shortcomings. Now, the Navy commanders, the top ones, knew that they were in a marathon, but they were still ready and willing to take calculated risks and pull off some pretty bold moves even at this very early stage of the war. So how do I think these books measure up overall? Quite frankly, I think they're terrific. Given what Ian Toll was trying to do, I'm not surprised that it took him over 10 years to write this whole thing and to finish it. The only fault I can find with these books is that there are not enough maps to suit me. I think battles like uh, Coral Sea and Midway uh, can be kind of confusing. And I wish that instead of presenting one or two maps to represent the whole battle, I would have appreciated more maps that addressed each phase of the battle. Yeah, but maybe I'm asking too much. Look, there is no question we have the finest Navy in the world. But it seems to me that that Navy was born, really, in World War II. And this trilogy explains how that actually came to be. So I absolutely recommend it. Volume one, Pacific Crucible, the trilogy, the Pacific War trilogy, the author, Ian Toll. Super recommend it. See you next week. Sunday mornings, I publish a review of a book that I think is worth bringing to your attention. Here are links to some of my other ones.